talking about, how I'm doing it, what I'm doing, and then we'll spend about 30 minutes also on actually turning something today. So that's my goal. That's what I'm trying to do. And uh, with that, let's get started. Yeah, the little doesn't look just like me. <laughs> I'm experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> all right, a couple things that I need to start us with. First of all, what I'm doing is not this complex, <laughs> and it's not this inside out. I love that picture. I can't imagine doing that much work just for a picture. And it's also um, not this time consuming. Now here's a couple of warnings and some ideas. Whenever you're using a skew, always wear a face shield. And don't use that kind of skew. Organization is the key to success. That's not my shop. That's mine. That's <laughs> Always use the right size tool. <laughs> That's John T. Shaw. <laughs> All right, so what's an inside out turning? An inside out turning is any turning that um, you, you turn once and some portion of it gets moved to the interior. So you're cutting it while it's on the exterior and then you're putting it to the interior. Uh, it's probably a lot easier if I just kind of show you some examples. Uh, you may have seen what was out on the front. Let if you go ahead with the, at least the front lights. Uh, I've got several of them up here, and some I'll, I'll talk about as we're going through, and some I won't. But uh, you're welcome to take a look at them, and some of them I can even hand around if you haven't seen them. Um, so when I'm doing an inside turning, mostly where I'm going to start with is what's the general idea I'm trying to get across. So I know that some of us are just trying to give Christmas gifts, and that's fine. But generally, I'm wanting to do a little more with the wood turning than what manual labor in Puerto Rico is going to do with it. So I'm trying to think of some idea or concept. And so in a thing like this, I was thinking about a tower. I was thinking about something medieval. Um, on something like this one, I'm thinking about something oriental that you might see in a Japanese garden. And so this one kind of has a rose theme. And, and you'll see as you look at them, kind of what is the feel I'm after. And I, I say that because in my mind, the inside out turnings go from being very, very simple to very, very complex. And so it's that whole range. So if you have already done a lot of inside out turnings that are, are just kind of something you might give away at a Christmas thing, um, that's fine. But at a certain level, you can still be doing the same ideas, an inside out turning, on something more complex. Uh, are like this, uh, crazy complex. Uh, this next one is kind of a key. Um, uh, Priscilla mentioned that you can make a chess set out of these. Like, yeah, you, you, you probably could, and, and that has been in my mind. This piece that's out there on the platform, you can actually see profiles of the king's faces. So uh, that one's kind of a meeting of four different kings, and we'll talk about how you can use this to duplicate shapes pretty easily. And then there's this piece here. So, well, why do we do them? So, Because you can't, because they're there to do. All right, three reasons, and the first one is the one that really grabbed me. It's a different kind of thinking. If you had the profiles drawn out of most bowls, if you just saw the profile in your head, you could say, oh, that's a goblet, or that's a bowl. It's very easy to, to get the shape and figure it out. Um, Suddenly when you're doing it this way, there's so many options that just the profile is not going to tell you what it's going to end up looking like. I'll kind of go into that a little bit. If you look at your normal inside and outside cut, the inside cut's going to be concave, the outside cut's going to be convex. So they go together, and whatever your goblet, whatever you're doing in a spindle turning, they're going to go together. And what happens if your inside diameter goes beyond your outside diameter? You get, a, you get a big hole, and suddenly your gouge turns into a cutoff tool. <laughs> yes, and your goblet turns into a napkin ring. <laughs> so it's a bad thing generally when this happens. However, when you're doing an uh, inside out turning, 
suddenly you can go beyond the inside diameter, can go beyond the outside diameter. And there you do get your holes. In fact, you get a pattern of holes. What makes it complex is this shape is determined by how far out you go or how far in you go and its thickness or its thinness, its depth. This is an arc, and as you get closer to the originating point, it gets to be a tighter arc. And so if it's far on the outside, it's very rounded. Far on this side, it's a, a broad shape. So it's a little more complex, and in that sense, it's a lot more fun thinking. Well, you do make complex holes. Let's see if I can explain. Uh, and you, you'll have this diagram on your paper. Here's kind of where we start with. This is an end, looking at the end of something. So here you have... Um, four pieces, but you could also do it with two. If you had two boards just like this, you could put them together and turn them and then flip the boards this way. So you could have a two-piece inside out turning, or you can have, in this case it's real obvious, here I've got four pieces here. If you wanted to do it with three, you can do that. So here's one that has three pieces, and I'll hand this around. Basically all I did to get this shape was I had a two before, uh, ten, well, I guess I had, I had a foot long, two before board that was a ten, 10 inch length, and I ran it through my band saw, at, or table saw, at this angle. So I just cut these off as fast as I wanted to, put them up against a disc sander to get them flat so that they glue together. You'll see that this shape then is the same thing on the six piece up there that's this. So I'm going to hand those around. You can take a look and see how they fit together and how, um, how it works out. Now, theoretically, of course, you could go up to th 360 pieces if you wanted to. Or more. Oh, for degrees. I guess you could do more if you weren't going with degrees. So, um, so when you glue them together, say you have three pieces, you come down here and um, move that up a little bit for you. Nope. Nope. I'll just make you dizzy instead. <laughs> but basically you turn this first around and then you flip that piece and you flip this piece and flip this piece. An example of that is right here. So this is a three piece. I have another one. Now when you do it, it's using a pine two before is a great idea because it's cheap, but pine is tough to turn. It tears, it's hard to cut, it's just and so these two pieces will hand around, you'll get an idea of it. But if, if you're more interested in doing something nice instead of cheap, don't use pine. All right, any questions? Are you getting this idea on what's going to happen? Yeah, Mark. I'm assuming you're turning all of these are dry, right? When you're turning these. Yes, yes. I had an, yeah, I think you'd want it not to be warping on you. Yeah. All right, what is it that you should know? Well, um, you want to match them precisely. If they don't glue up flat and well, you, you have a risk of failure, and certainly it's not going to look good. So getting a 90 degree, or in the case of this, getting a, a 60 and a 120 angle, that's real important. Getting a very flat, smooth edge is real important. The same things for use it through segment wood, the same things you want in a good match there, you want to do the same things here. Um, and then bond, James, uh, just bond. Uh, I'm using uh, CA glue for all of these. It works pretty well. I, I read, has anybody ever used a paper glue bond yeah. between it? Okay. Um, I, you can. I don't know why you would. For me, the super glue works great. Um, so for, for the first gluing up, this is what I do. And, and typically, it's not much glue. I'm going to put maybe... Got a camera for them. Don't do it over a computer. Yeah. I'm going to use about that much glue. I think you could use a lot more if you wanted to. Sometimes I do. But in reality, it ends up uh, being a very strong bond anyway. And you'll see what I do to make it a little safer in case it's not. So we're going to work with that a little later. But that's all I do. You do want to make sure you're very straight and flush on it. Um, you could tape that, clamp it however you feel best. Again, you'll see I'm not too worried about it. Uh, then I don't worry about a lot of things. So that's what I'm going to start with on it. And then I'm going to use my strapping tape. 
just to be really careful. So while I trust that glue, it's kind of like auditors. You trust, but you check anyway. So I'm going to just run some strapping tape. And you see my super glue is not even set up yet. I'm going to turn it, all four pieces at once, okay. and then I'm going to turn them, or all three pieces, then I'm going to turn them and, and do it again. Oh, okay. So, I, you'll get a better idea when I'm actually doing the, the demo a little bit. Yeah? If, if you were to cover that whole face with super glue, you'd never get that thing apart, would you? Well, that's or what you, you think. You think super glue is really tough, and it is tough on, uh, on going apart this way. If I was trying to pull it apart, I wouldn't be able to. But if I try and chisel it and, and shear it, you'll see that super glue is not, not very strong. The, the shear, it's actually brittle. It actually becomes brittle. Its shear strength is very poor. Yeah, so so you, you remember the guy hanging by his hat? You guys remember that commercial with one drop of super glue? Yeah, pulling it apart, I don't know how much, you, you do a lot. But if he had been up there and somebody had just kind of hit a chisel right between that to try and split this way, well, they wouldn't have put it on there. Or if he just went sideways, he would have been on the floor in a hurry. Might have been. <laughs> I'm going to show you what I'm doing here just so you can see it's, it's not a big thing. I've, I've flipped that over, you know, so there's a tab on it. Well, that's nice, but when it's spinning, sometimes that'll hit the, the tool rest. It's kind of annoying. And sometimes even it's hard for me to see it to pull it up. So I usually just use a little masking tape and just tape, not that little, I tape it down with masking tape and that makes it a lot easier to find later when I'm trying to take it off. So maybe you don't have that kind of problem, but for me this has been real helpful. Okay, so in a little while that's what we're going to work on that. Uh, okay, so you saw the strapping tape. I use zip ties also, you know, the little things that you go back into and pull tight. Um, those are real secure. Uh, they won't hold it from twisting, so that's why you need the super glue and the tape. But uh, if you're worried that something like this is going to fly apart, use the zip ties to hold it down. And finally, when you're finishing, so you, you've already turned it once, you're, you've turned it, you've done the inside and the outside. When you're, when you're ready to put it together, let me say that again. After you've turned it once and you're rotating it to the inside, you're going to want to use wood glue. On some of these, I've got one out there. I just use super glue on the final gluing, and it's it's come apart. So I don't know if I might have set it down once and it kind of hit at an angle or something like that. So on your final, when you're putting it together for the last time, use wood glue.